This podcast is brought to you by GA Sports. GA Sports is home of the O'Connor Slitty, Ireland's number one hurling ball used by 311 clubs nationwide. Hello and you're welcome to this week's Backdoor Hurling Show. Delighted to be joined by Sky Sports editor Brian Barry and former Kilkenny hurler Kieran Joyce. Um, big news emerging today, lads. Uh, Shane Dowling's retirement. Kieran, was fair too. Hard to believe he's only twenty-seven. Yeah, he's, he's been around a while. Um, I, I thought he was near my age now, but uh, no, he's a young guy. He obviously, he broke onto Limer team a number of years ago. Um, he's been around for a long, long time. Um, true, I suppose the old Limer team and then the new Limer team that came in and uh, the new young young team that came along, but. Yeah, look, he's, he, he was, he's been a talisman for Limerick there for years and even for his club um, as well. So, you know, a big loss. And I think he's Limerick's top scorer still at 27 years of age. So, you know, that, that kind of shows the calibre of the man. Yeah, and Brian, like, he had an unbelievable career. He scored 21 goals and 292 points in 51 uh, league games. Probably known as the super sub late on in his career, but he burst onto the scene, I think it was in 2012. Yeah, he's um he obviously got that all earned or the all star should say in twenty fourteen and when he was the main man when they won the the monster as well the year before. Like he was like obviously Limerick kinda of took a step back then for a few years, lost to Dublin and the qualifiers and took a few beatings and but when they came again under John Coyley then he was as you mentioned, he was the super sub and he probably was a victim of his own like you know that impact like when he was coming on, almost shoehorned into the Ollie Gunnar Solskjaer role. Yeah. Even though he dragged him over the line in that Cork semi-final, he was never going to start the final because they almost knew we'll bring him on after 50, 60 minutes and he'll raise the crowd and everything like that. But he's um explosive hurler and one of the most original hurlers, I suppose, you'll ever see. Like uh, the, the two clips down the round today were that goal against Shaq Neal that he flicked, blocked down the keeper and flicked it over and volleyed it into the net. And then the other one when he battered it down uh, in last year's All-Ireland semi-final for us. I remember being at that game and just looking and just saying, what's he doing? The split second, just thinking, what's he doing? He's not going to bat it in from there. Oh, okay, he's tried it. That's a bit of a waste. Oh, holy crap, he's after executing it to perfection, sticking it in the corner. So, explosive and original hurler. And as I say, it's a pity that he's, he's retiring at 27, but there's bigger things in life, I suppose, in terms of if you're if it's going to affect you long term in terms of those injuries and everything so it's um best luck to him and hopefully we see him in the Pearsy jersey again soon yeah and kieran obviously sad to see him go um it's due to his injuries uh he's explaining today uh seen on the video that like he couldn't walk with these kind of injuries i suppose this was mainly down to the fact why we probably seen him in a super super sub role late in his career but you kind of have to put him in that category of the tj reeds the joe kennings and the patrick Ireland's. You would, yeah. I suppose he's um, he was he's a gifted hurler. Um, you know, he's I suppose as he's, as he's, as you can compare him to the other likes of players. You know, he, he can see things that other guys probably couldn't see, um, and and that's why he's probably in that kind of category. Such a clean, crisp striker, the ball. Um, no matter what the weather, you know, I've seen him in spilling rain before, knocking frees over the bar from ninety yards. You know, so he, he was one of those skillful hurlers that always struck the ball the right way, could see the right pass when it needs to be. And like, you know, Shane's not going to tell you, he's not going to kill you with pace or, or that kind of stuff. He wasn't, he wasn't going to be a complete athlete, but he managed to get around. He managed to find in pockets of space that he required to get uh, and obviously keep the right pass in the right time. And that's why I suppose he became kind of a super sub towards the towards the tail end of his career with Limerick. And um, probably probably a bit, a bit of a downfall on, on his side, but look, I suppose he's happy. Um, in a sense that he got a chance to win All Ireland, you know, he got a chance, obviously, to play with your club and win All Ireland with your club as well, you know, which is very special. So, um, look, I know the county might be finished for him. You never know, club. You know, hopefully he'll get back again. Um, but obviously, look, any sort of injuries like that, you know, and I've seen some great players go back with injuries and that as well. Um, you know, he just has to manage it now and manage the body because. Look, I suppose sport takes up about 20 or 30 years of your life, but you know you have another 20 or 30 years you're trying to be physically able and fit to probably play golf or do whatever you want to do after that, you know. So a lot of these guys probably have to manage the, the body as well, you know, and that's why he's probably, probably taking the right choice in, 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 in stepping down. And Brian, like, can even be a big loss for the Limerick hurlers coming off the bench? Like, we've seen the impact he made 2018, 
the semi and the final 2019 against Kilkenny. Like it's it's, it's a big blow for Limerick Carlos to lose Shane Dowling. Well, as we saw, I think like there was no better example of um, the fact that modern hurling is a 20-man game now. It doesn't take the bare 15 to drag you over the line. No better example than that Limerick team two years ago when they went and won the All Ireland. Like if and and he was like the first name off the bench, and there was a hum around Co Park or the Gaelic grounds every time he came on because he loved that. And he did it on the biggest stages. He did it against Cork and Galway in the 18. He did it last year against Kilkenny, albeit they did come up short. So. He's, um, like, a, of course, is a, a loss of a player of his calibre in his prime and his mid-twenties is a huge loss for any team and it's a huge loss, loss for Limerick. So, and that, like, he comes across as a real leader as well, a real character and a real, you know, he was, like, even down at the homecoming in 2018, it was down there and he, he was the one on the mic belt and out from Scalza Gary Owen and they seemed to be banding around him. So, in terms of that, I'd say he's a bit of a, fairly vocal in the dressing room as well so there's that void to fill as well I suppose and the news obviously emerging of the inter-county draws last weekend um, lads um, it's going to be a winter hurling competition I suppose firstly we'll start with you here and we'll move on to you then Brian do you think teams it's going to suit some teams and not suit some teams for this uh, winter hurling championship game yeah, I suppose it, it will. Um, if, if you're looking at, <laughs> based on Irish weather and based on, on how predictable the weather is going to be at that time of the year, it might suit a more physical, stronger team um, that are obviously big and strong in the back and, you know, obviously physically on the forward as well. You'd be looking at the likes of the Galways, who would be confident. Um, Kilkenny, you'll think, you know, they'll be confident as well. Tipper, a physical team. You know, who might struggle in that sort of weather, if, if you're looking at it from the outset, you know, the likes of Clare might struggle. Limerick will will figure as well, because they're a big physical team as well. You know, and, it's, and it, it comes down to who has a skill and the capacity to play in that sort of weather. If you're going to get wind, rain, um, blustery night and turless, you know, um, you really see pure skill come to the fore, you know, uh, and which will be a challenge in some ways, it'll be expected in other ways, but, you know, it might make for the, the clean, crisp championship problem we're used to seeing in, in, in June, July and August, you know, uh, speed and tempo, but yeah, look, if, if, if the weather keeps going the way it's going and, and it's predictable as it is, it'll suit big, physical, strong team um, that obviously are compact at the back and they have a couple of natural ball winners in the forwards, Do you know, that can win 50-50 ball or 70-30 ball that, other teams can't, you know. So, um, you, you you know, maybe even the likes of Wexford might struggle as well if you're trying to play that short kind of possession game plan, you know, and that sort of weather for breaks down. But, um, look, it's going to be a challenge for, for every county. And But I, I do think a couple of the big physical teams will will, will, will look at that and, and they'll look to try and target that sort of game plan as well. Yeah, like, and Brian, it's going to be tough for them teams, as uh, Kieran mentioned, to clear the Wexford. Like, trying to work it through the channels, play a possession-based game, in the winter, uh, it's, it's going to be tough, like. Yeah, and well, and I think Brian Lohan and Davy Fitzgerald and that oh, that Cork in there, Kieran Kingston will recognise mm -hmm. that that they're they kind of say from the outside, right? Because Cork in particular, they, the last few years in the league, you could almost almost see they were working towards the summer game, and here look, they were taking or leaving the league, and they're they're aiming for that of the ground hurling and they were looking to peak in the Munster Championship then once that got rolling and that worked for them for the last few years so they I'd imagine they'll be looking at this and saying okay we have to set up differently how are we going to do that perhaps is is a different personnel that we're going to put in rather than just um stick with the same game plan so they have a few weeks to figure that out um and just to echo what Kieran was saying yeah it's like it's it's a different ball game. Everybody's played hurling on a dirty old November evening or something. And the other thing is um that straight out is the cold. I think everybody's talking about a wet ball and everything like that. But we're trying to play hurling on a cold day. If it's low zero to five degrees and you try to strike a ball, you're not gonna get a good stroke in it. And that's applicable from junior hurling all the way up to level we saw. I think it was cool against Napierschig in an all Ireland final in the the drawn game and Pro Park when it was pretty much freezing zero degrees temperature there on Paddy's Day one year and it was um and all the top hurlers like Shane Dowling was playing Conor Callahan all these guys and they couldn't strike the ball properly because it was just that cold so that's probably a factor too like so just anybody who's played hurling on a winter's day but again in terms of if it's not too cold if it stays dry 
the pitches will hold up because this this championship is going to be played across three or four pitches, probably across North Turles, North even Nolan Park, maybe which are all the carpets. A lot of science gone in behind them to actually maintain a high quality. So if not, if the weather holds up, the standard will hold up. But going back to the question, yeah, absolutely. I think there's going to be a few managers who will have to rethink their game plan, and Wexford and Cork, I reckon, will be on the top of that. Yeah, that's a very valid point about cold weather, Brian. Um, Kieran, is that hard when you're playing early and, and your hands are as cold as they could be and trying to warm them up like in the heat of battle, trying to, catch, across the uh, trying to catch a dirty ball? Like. Well, if you're a back, it does, you, you don't mind it too much. Um, it's lower ground, uh, it slows down the forwards a bit. But uh, yeah, look, it, it is a challenge. Uh, the first 10 minutes is always the hardest, I suppose, until you, until you get the hands warm um, and adapting to the adapting to the weather um you know that's that's going to be a big impact as well and you know <laughs> I, I know it look the lads be highly motivated you know it's hard to motivate some guys to go out and play in that sort of weather you know but obviously i know because it'll be a short enough season and that as well there, there should be no excuse in the motivation side but look it will you know it'll suit the very clean crisp hurlers as well they're great the great strikers of the ball you know the likes of the shane dowlins that kind of thing that came tj's and then the lads that can you know, strike the ball no matter what the weather. You know that that will really suit them down to it, um, and it, it will it will suit the guys that are big and physical and can get through the get through the challenges and break the lines. You know, so look, it obviously is weather, weather dependent. I know the pitches are going to be in great nick, as, uh, as Brian was saying, but um, yeah, look, I I think teams will probably be gearing themselves up to be you know to be physically strong uh, in whatever capacity they can in, in that short time period. But obviously, a game plan that. You know, you're trying to get the ball to your main men as 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 efficiently as possible, um, and that kind of thing. And look, it's going to be an interesting championship, by all means. But I I probably do favour a couple of the the the, the older boys, the the, the more um, experienced teams and the more physical teams that probably will be in the last four, maybe. Yeah, and we'll just look at the Munster Championship draw first. Um, we'll start with you for one side of the draw, Brian. And then we'll move on to Kieran. Um, Clare and Limerick, local derby, and um, Clare obviously they they need to win this one really. Um, it's a local derby, and they will be building for this, but it's a massive challenge for them. Yeah, they got a bad beating last year, but um, like it's it's not too long ago that Clare did a number on them and beat Limerick by eleven points down in Cusack Park two years ago. So it's swings and roundabouts, I suppose, in terms of that. Um, the one thing I would say about that game is that whoever does win it will have a championship game under their belt going into tip. They'll probably have a challenge game or two under their belt but that's against the Leinster team or two, I'd imagine. But you can't replicate championship hurl. And so I reckon whoever does go on to win that will um, will have a big advantage. But if you're talking about teams who thrive during the winter, Limerick have been absolutely flying in the league the last few years on some pretty bad weather nights like you've seen them and they've come out in real battles and stuff so and everybody's talking about Limerick we know okay Dowling's gone but in terms of just raw players you see some of those guys are absolutely massive and bulked up the last few years guys like Willow and um, Willow Donahue in the midfield there you, you know everybody's getting bigger you see these lads Aaron Galan and Keane Lynch they're not long out of under 21 and they're still developing and growing outwards kind of way you know so I reckon they'll be up for the fight but and um, yeah, if you're Tipperary, that's that's the game. Like in terms of if Tip do get over that semi, they'll take they'll take some beating because that's going to be a massive challenge coming up against a team who's already hit the ground running. So um, yeah, I, I would say for that you're looking Limerick. If if you're a betting man right now, you'd say Limerick are coming out that side of the draw. But again, you've all learned champions in there. Your player who were weren't very far away two years ago and only got knocked out on points difference last year. So it was or, so again, it's, it's hard to call. We'll say Limerick will come out though. And just looking at that semi final, Cork and Waterford, uh, Kieran, it's obviously an easier side of the draw. But if you're Waterford, you have to fancy your chances. Haven't won a game in two years in the championship to go straight into the semi-final. Coming up against a core team who look to have a few issues at the back, Waterford have showed signs of progress. So you're, if you're Waterford, you're kind of thriving on that draw. You are, yeah. And they'll be complete underdogs as well, um, which will suit them. So you will, yeah. And look, I suppose Waterford have a few physical players as well. Um, they'll be looking to bring the physicality. 
they'll be looking probably go back to a more orthodox style of hurling, um, I suppose, and they'll probably be looking for a couple of their main lads to have a big season, you know, the likes of the Aussie Gleasons, these guys, you know, they um, they can turn it on, you know, get, get he has two or three games, he could, he, could, he could turn the championship for Waterford, you know, so they're, they're very dependent on that. Um, if, if it was Waterford a couple of years ago with the likes of uh, Brian O'Halloran and a few of them lads, you know, um, in good form, you know, I'd be very confident. Um, I still think Cork have a lot of skill, a lot of class, um, and they have a lot of club hurlers that have been playing throughout, you know, the, the bad seasons as well. And, you know, it likes Patrick Corbin as well. He's he's in the, the form of his life at the moment, so I suppose the last couple of seasons. So it, it's going to be a tough one. Um, it's going to be nip tuck. It, it's going to be tight. And I, to <laughs> be honest, I think some of these games could come down to mistakes um, in this sort of weather. I think it could come down, could come down to a couple of errors. I might lay in a goal or two here because I think there could be an awful lot of extra time. There could be an awful lot of very tight games here because... It's, it's not going to be shooting the lights out with the weather-wise, I don't think, but um, it'll come down to the free-takers, absolutely, and um, I think Cork have a, a, a very, very established free-taker that no matter hail or in or shine, he'll, he'll put them over. Um, and obviously then, look, Waterford have it as well, but Waterford at times can, you know, even with the likes of Ozzy there, you know, before he shooting for points from 120 yards away, you know, so <laughs> that's not going to happen this season, I, I don't think, but... Um, yeah, look, I think Warford have a chance, absolutely. Um, but I do think Cork are a seasoned team as well. They have a couple of seasoned players. If the, if they can shore up the back uh, and obviously get that spine uh, right, they have every chance. You know, they they could hit a monster final. But at the moment, yeah, I would favour I would favour Cork to go through. But you know, you, you can't write off Warford. And Brian, like it's a long way back to if you're, uh, if Limerick beat Clare, like it'll be a long way back for Clare to get to an All Ireland final. Like they'll find it really tough, and you'd be surprised if a team who loses in the quarter final get all the way to the final. And then you could have uh, a game going to penalties, and that'd be a tough way to decide it. Yeah, you're right. It's a long way back. You're straight into last chance saloon, especially if you're. Um... It, uh, so there's there's two rounds of qualifiers. You could get a buy into the second round, or you could be straight in if, if argument's sake, you get just drawn in against the loser Wexford or Galway, or Kilkenny were to get upset in, in the other half. You're looking it's do or die straight away, and it might only be one or two weeks after your loss and to pick yourself up off the floor like that. But one thing is, it's about momentum, isn't it? You see, in the last few years, the other thing is it's these teams, the round robin system has, I suppose, engraved in these teams and, and their psyche in terms of quick turnarounds. And you can't let a loss get you two down in the dumps because you have to pick it up for the next week. We saw Cork last year; they got a bad beating at home to Tipperary. They turned it around on seven days' notice and went up and beat the All Ireland champion Limerick in their own backyard. So, in terms of that, you're going to have to turn it around. Penalties, it's a uh, it's, I suppose, a necessary evil of the air. There's absolutely no wriggle room for, in terms of the calendar. You have to finish it on the day in some way. Is there other ways of doing it? Possibly so. But again, it's it's probably off, at the end of 80 minutes of hurling or 90 minutes of hurling when the teams aren't separated. Is it fair to play another 10 minutes aside of extra time when the team might be needed to play again seven days later? And in terms of player welfare, it's a necessary evil, I think, those penalties. So, is it an ideal way to win or lose a championship game? Well, it's probably an ideal way to win it. You don't mind as long as you win, but in terms of losing, it has to be done some way. And unfortunately, there's just so little time to championship. So, it's probably the, uh, the best possible solution in this case. So. And Kieran, um, obviously from Kilkenny, you have to be happy with that draw you've got. Yeah, look, they will, they will be happy. Uh, look, you, you can't take anything for granted. Um, but look, yeah, they, they'll, they'll be happy enough with that. They're not, they're not meeting any of the big guns. Hopefully until ends the final. So, um, you know, um, look, they'll, they'll be happy. Um, I suppose it's, it's up to Kilkenny now to gear up and obviously to get their. The main key guys like Sir Richie Hogan's and obviously the TJs um, in that sort of form and obviously get them through the club championship. You know, like every county, they'll be looking to um, make sure their main guys obviously perform for the club but kind of get them through the championship because obviously there's no wiggle room here for injuries, um, for any any sort of muscle tears or any sort of broken fingers or anything like that that can happen. Um, there's very little turnaround time for a lot of these players. So that's probably the big thing, I suppose, that for an awful lot of counties as well, an awful lot of county managers will be hoping that they get their main guys through. Um, for Kilkenny especially, like, you know, we're so dependent on TJ the last couple of years that um, it's scary, I suppose, how dependent we are on him. 
Um, and even, I suppose, I'd be, I'd be hoping the likes of Richie, you know, will get back into form as well because Richie can maybe carry a bit of the burden um, off TJ, you know, because um, any man on, on his day, you know, TJ can be, can be, you know, they could have three or four lads on him and you, you want the other guys kind of stepping up when, when that happens. But um, look, that's Brian's, I suppose, focus now is obviously the club championship starts up now in the next couple of weeks for us and uh, obviously the county lads getting through um, injury-free uh, like every other county. Yeah, just touch back with you there, Kian. Um Could there be a chance now that we'll see Adrian Mullen this year? Um, he done his career shoot to start the year. Um, obviously, there's been an extended break now. Is there a chance he could appear for Kilkenny? There, there might well be, yeah. Um, it's it's very quiet at the moment, I suppose. I haven't heard much in terms of how he's going recovery-wise. Um, I suppose it's partially because it doesn't, there hasn't been really any media in terms of with the counties now, I suppose, happened the last, the last number of months. But... Yeah, look, he has a chance. Um, what's on his side is he's young. He'll obviously recover an awful lot quicker than 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 uh, if you're a little bit older, getting getting through it. Um, I haven't heard anything bad in terms of the rehab going with it. So, um, look, he'd be a massive addition. Um, he'd be my one of one of the most exciting players for Kilkenny in the next couple of years coming. Um, and he obviously showed his proof there last year um, uh, and that when he played. And um, obviously he had a phenomenal year for Ballyhale as well. So... I'd be hoping he won't be around for Ballyhale anyway, so we might have a chance at the club. <laughs> Wouldn't mind seeing him talking out to Black and Amber again, but uh, yeah, look, time will tell. Obviously, he's getting the best treatment um, with Lee Kenny. I know, look, with, with likes of Cushies, now you can turn it around within six months, um, everything going well, six or seven months. So, look, you'd be hoping that he's that he's in form, but nobody knows. You know, everything's kind of very closed-lipped at the moment, and that, uh, and... Um, Probably won't know until 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 a couple of weeks time with Ballyhale and that. We'll see if 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 he's even figuring with them in terms of talking out or anything like that. But uh, I'd be hoping hoping for Kenny. We'll need him anyway. And uh, Galway Wexford in another semi final. Uh, there's probably going to be nothing in this prime. Um, apart from 2017, there's been nothing between the sides. But a massive boost for Galway is Joseph Cooney now returning to the setup. Yeah, um, and well, the the main thing about Galway is that Shane O'Neill looked like he was very cognizant of the fact was that they needed to move on that team a bit. You can't just they came back with the same team from 2017. Michal Dunahu a the few years later, he wasn't recycling, and as when you're on top, you need to probably keep get and bring Cody as a master that maybe injecting or two players every single year. But Shane O'Neill seemed to be doing that throughout the league. Um, Brian Concannon, I know he's been starting the last year or two, but he really took on, took a step up during the league. We saw Evan Island having a good game uh, against Tipperary that day in their stadium. And um, and Clinton Burke is another guy who is just off the back of the long recovery from a cruciate injury as well from St. Thomas in the um, All-Ireland final last year. He's probably a guy who could come back in. So they'll be hoping to get a few players in and freshen things up for Galway. We know that um, he had the Rob McInerney moved around the park as well, so he's trying a few things. Um, and as we mentioned already, Galway, uh, they have Lucas in with them doing the, the strength and condition, and they're, they're big, big men as well. So there's more question marks over Wexford heading into a winter game in terms of will that kind of game plan work again. But as we said, they haven't been found wanting on uh, in league games the last few years. It's hard to know, as everybody said. I don't think anybody's kind of got down off the fence and said this team will win or that team will win when it comes to Wexford goal. It's, it's very much on the day and we won't know until then. Yeah, exactly. Um, Kieran, we'll actually just talk about the Kilkenny Hurley Championship here. Uh, obviously a tough championship to win. But yeah. Uh, Read and write, your league is going to be tied in with the championship this year? It is, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's uh, four, we have four, is it four groups of three. Um, and I suppose on our side, we have our first game is Dixborough. Then we have Clara and Mullinavat. So, um, and then in, in, in our actual official group then is um, Castle Cobra and Greg Valley Callum. So, however we play against the three of them obviously dictates how what level you go uh, in the group. So if we finish first, obviously you go into the quarters. Uh, second, you go into the first round, and then third, then you're into relegation side. Well, probably first round again, anyway. So um, yeah, look, it's going to be tough. Uh, I suppose we're guaranteed five matches, which is great. Um, obviously, you'd be hoping that that'll be that'll be uh, it'll, it'll be five or six, seven uh, matches. But um, yeah, it, look, it, it's going to be ticking fast. We're uh, starting the the bank holiday weekend. Uh, of August and we're every game every weekend after that going forward so 
Look, it's, it, it, I suppose from the club point of view, um, we, we look, you're, you're getting five games. Um, it, it seems to be well spaced out. You know, you've heard of other counties as well, kind of cutting it very short and having games in the mid midweek and that kind of stuff. So, um, and I suppose we, we don't have the the um, football issue of Jewel. So <laughs> it makes it a little bit easier on Kenny. So uh, we can give full focus for that. But um, yeah, look, as I said, um, it's... Uh, it's gas. We went back training there two weeks ago now, and we have forty-five lads out training. You know, so uh, and for a rural club, that's unique. I, I haven't been on the pitch now and had forty-five lads training before, so it's mad. You know, just, just the COVID and the lockdown has made lads come back, and you, you see lads coming out of woodwork now you haven't seen in years. So um, it's great. It's great for the club, uh, and I suppose it's, I, I think that's that's true. An awful lot of clubs, you know, an awful lot of people are coming back playing. Um, but obviously, look from our point of view, we have four weeks now to get it. To get ourselves up to up to the standard we want to, and uh, we have a couple of challenge matches organised um, with various clubs uh, around the country as well. So, and I think that's that's the norm for a lot of clubs now at the moment. You know, there's there's going to be challenge matches galore now for the next few weeks. But um, look, it's fantastic. When I first spoke to you, Paul, sure, I wasn't even sure we we're going to have a, a championship. So, uh, you know, it's uh, it's it's a big plus, and uh, looking forward to it. And Brian, the big question in Kilkenny will be, uh, can Valley Hale Shamrocks be stopped, really? Yeah, um, still the team to beat, I suppose. Um, uh, I'm aware I'm an outsider looking in now and hearing it now a lot more about it than me, but in terms of the last few years, it looks like Valley Hale are the team to beat. You saw what they've gone on and done back to back all Ireland titles, but um, they've... The, the one thing you'd say about Kilkenny is anybody can beat anybody on the day. You could throw a blanket over definitely the other 11 teams in the chasing pack. Um, James Stevens obviously ran belly hair close last year, but I, I know they were spearheaded by, uh, kind of backboned by Jackie Tyrrell and Owen Larkin, where had some fairly central roles. They were they were um, in around the team when they won back-to-back -back Leinsters 15, 16 years ago and won that all around as well. So they probably have, I think Cheddar Plunkett is down in charge of them. They probably have a bit of thinking to do. But again, like Ballyhale could get caught in any day. Um, you're looking at Dixborough, as Clara won, won it the last few years, or Loch and Gale as well. So there's so many teams in there in with a shout, I'd imagine. But again, I'd bow to Kieran's knowledge on this one. as He's, I suppose, a lot more ear to the ground and also in action as well down there in the next few weeks. So. Yeah, absolutely. Exactly. And uh, just looking at the Limerick group, um, Nipirchi and Kilmallock and Ahane in one group. Nipirchi and Kilmallock in a three-team group, Kieran. That's going to be awful tight. And um, with Shane Dowling now not available for Nipirchi, it makes it even tighter. It does, yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, it, uh, I suppose. And even the last couple of years with TG Carter and that, we got a chance to see what, uh, I suppose, the club championships uh, are like in other counties. Uh, and uh, you've seen a couple of Limerick games, yeah. They're fiercely, um, fiercely tight, fiercely competitive. Um, obviously, two main teams that have obviously uh, represented Limerick uh, further afield in, in that. So, you know, look, there's going to be a couple of big teams that are not going to be progressing um, on, on this basis, the way these are structured this year. Um, what it will suit, will obviously suit a bigger squad. Um, I think Nipir should probably have a little bit more strength and depth than maybe Kilmallock would have um, based on uh, outside of the 15. So, And I think from a club point of view, and the way, the way club matches are gone now, I, I think it's your impact. Your last 10 minutes in a lot of games now makes a big difference for an awful lot of clubs. Um, if you're if you're not far if if you're not uh, too far ahead in matches that you know a couple of subs can come on one or two subs can come on and make a big difference and I think probably Napier should probably have a bit more strength and depth even though I know Shane is, is going to be a big loss but this this look there's still a very experienced outfit there um, a lot of good hurlers there coming up and a lot of good good lads under age coming up as well so um, and but a lot of tradition between both both clubs as well so you know it, it's going to be a great championship um I, I haven't heard really many many of the draws in other counties but you know that's that's a, that's a juicy one to have anyway yeah and then if you just look at the other group um brian patrick's well a day and doing patrick's well will obviously want to push on because they probably feel disappointed with their monster championship performance last year and when you have a team of in your team when you have keen lynch jeremy burns and aaron galan you have to fancy your chances yeah and i suppose like a lot of teams have to Especially when you're out so soon after your first county in a while, obviously there's a few celebrations to be done and everything like that. So it's rare enough sometimes that you see a team come straight out, have not won county in a while and really hit the ground running in the province. So, um, like if they were to get through, and well, obviously there's no provincial this year, but the, 
was going to say they shot the Pearson last year and the Pearson were odds on favourite for the All Ireland before they before they were even out of the county last year, obviously they got the cold. But any team with Aaron Galan you mentioned it, and those guys, you know, they've won all Ireland, they're still in their early twenties, they're only gonna get better, you know, and that's a frightening prospect for the rest of them. But um from what I've seen the last few years, we got down to a few games the last few years. Does that well, there was the top six group per se where the top six teams in the county play each other and there was the second tier of six then and that top six group was really Kind of fierce, but again, there seems to be a bit of a gap between um, Patrick's well and the Pearshig, and then the rest really. Kilmallocker probably the next closest, but again, it seems to be a big dip. So I'd imagine it'll uh, Limerick this year again will be between the Pearshig or Patrick's well. Yeah, well, just move on now to um, you're both going to pick three players each who could have a big championship for the counties this year. So um, we'll start with you, Kieran. Yeah, I suppose when you're looking at it, um, I didn't want to be too biased and go go Kilkenny route, but um, I think I'm expecting a big championship from Tony Kelly. Um, I suppose being on the receiving end of marking him a few times, you know, when he's on form, he's unmarkable. Um, and plus with Ballyhay then, I suppose he went through a club championship there before as well. He nearly carried the club through it in, in Hale Rain or Shine as well. So a couple of years ago. So, you know, um, He's, he's a great player. You know, I'm expecting big things from him. Um, I think he is going to have one season where everything's going to click. You know, and when he gets in that sort of form as well, he can hit seven or eight points from midfield, you know. So he's, he's that sort of player. Um, and it's uh, I, I expect a big championship. He's been quite the last number of years for his standard. Um, now, I know, look, he's he, with Clare, obviously, he, you know, it, it's a team that have won all Ireland. You know, they probably should have been competing for more uh, the last number of years. And I know we spoke about this before, I suppose they have underachieved. Um, you know, probably if you had a couple of probably other players around him maybe to, to, to carry the burden a bit more, he, he might be able to express himself a bit more. But I'm expecting a big championship from Tony. Um, I'd be hoping so anyway. Um, next player then, I do think there's a big championship. I think Ozzy Gleeson is due uh, a big season again. I said that for Waterford there. Uh, another player, I suppose, when he's at the peaks of his powers there, um, I remember for a semi-final against Kenny there one year we were playing, you know, he could just jump a foot higher than most lads. He could solo pass lads. You know, he was just in that form that he was unmarkable at times, you know. And, um, you know, he's so much skill and a great striker of the ball. And I suppose the big thing with, with, with Ozzy is just temperament, you know, uh, and, and that kind of thing. And I suppose that's probably been his, you know, sometimes he might, you know, drop the head a bit and he might get frustrated with his game or that. And, uh, but look, if you... If he nails if he nails those sort of aspects in his game, you know, he can be he can be an unstoppable machine. Um and then I suppose the last player, um, I would think likes Kyle Hayes from Limerick. Um I think this type of weather, this type of season, physical guy, he's well able to get up and down the pitch. I am expecting a big season from Limerick. Um I do think look, they're going to really come back and, and compete this year. Um and I do think I suppose when they won the All Ireland that year, he was kind of I suppose he was an unsung hero for me in a lot of ways. He probably didn't get the, the, the all the plaudits and the credits that I, I thought he deserved. You know, he's playing centre forward. It's a hard role to play. Um, he gets up and down and he covers so much for the, the half-back and the midfielders at times as well. And um, and that and I'd, I'd love to see his, his GPS his GPS tracks because he, he is up and down the field non-stop and he's big, physical, and he can run no matter what the weather. So I think that those three players, I think you'd be hoping to see them in the top flight and they, they'll have a good season. Yeah, we'll move on to you now, Brian, to pick your three players um, who you believe can have a big championship for the counties. Um, we'll start with Kip. I reckon Jake Morris, um, he's obviously coming through. We saw what he's been able to do off the bench under Liam Shady and what he did kind of on the under-20 and under-21 All-Ireland title the last few years. Now, if you ask me who is going to dislodge in the starting team, I've no idea because you're looking and you're saying you've Jason Ford, you've Jamie Cameron, you've Bubbles, you've all these guys and like is so star-studded, but at the same time, Sheedy's probably thinking as well, we've got to question things up, and these guys are too good to leave out at the same time, he's coming up, but like he's done it at every level except for senior in the county, he's got a chance in the league and a few games like that, so we'll be looking forward to seeing if he breaks into that team and playing alongside those uh, top-class forwards, but I reckon he could have a big say in the championship. Um, another is Liam Rush with Dublin, uh, I did, like Dublin had a bit of a mi mixed league uh, at best, I suppose, but Rush, about five, six years ago, he was up there with the best hurl hurlers in Ireland. He's, like, he's a guy you're going to put in on the edge of the square because 
he can do damage in there, especially if Dublin are playing as well, they field or anything like that, or if they were to get a home game and turn the park, they he's a guy, he's a massive handful. And Dublin are gonna they're gonna pack their board line, I think, with big strong players like Conor Keeney and John Hederton as well. But um Liam Rush is somebody who can lift his game again. He's had injury problems last few years, but he'll be there thereabouts. We already mentioned them as well, Jensen Burke, who's um, off the back from Galway, who's gone to, well, he's off the back of a crucial recovery anyway, and he's somebody who was, he was strong in those St. Thomas's runs as well, so it'll be interesting to see whether he can score up the Galway defence, and um, I suppose, like, Galway needs something as well, just refreshing to hold him up, and he looks like a top class back in there. Well, that's all uh, on part one of the Backdoor Hurling show. Um, next up on the show, we have Graham O'Cahey talking about his Limerick success. Backdoor Hurling show. Delighted to be joined by Limerick and Kilmal Kerger, uh, Graham O'Cahey. Firstly, Graham, you must be delighted that the Hurling season's coming back. Yeah, it's great. Um, we went back club training there. We met um, last Wednesday evening, so um, well, it was lovely to, to have a bit of a break, be back training and be kind of Back mixing with the with the guys was a a nice a nice um change. How did you find the pandemic and everything training by yourself? Um, was it challenging? Um, for the first number of weeks, I suppose when it, when we thought maybe championship might be returning in in June or maybe July, it was kind of easy easy enough to stay motivated and stay on top of of your program. But I suppose once it kind of transpired that it was going to be a long term thing and that championship was likely going to be the latter part of the year if there was going to be any championship at all. I think that made it a lot more difficult to, to stay motivated, certainly. And obviously now we're going to do your championship. Do we have to do anything different in your preparation now than you do if it was a summer championship? Um, I'd probably say not. Um, like For myself, I wouldn't be looking beyond the, the club championship at the moment. I think like trying to get fit now and match ready for the end of July and hopefully put in a couple of good performances with the club and, and go the distance with the club would be the main priority for myself and for a lot of players. But I think the confidence and the, the fitness you gain out of that will take into the into the inter-county scene. So I think a lot of players are certainly looking forward to, to that aspect of it. And obviously now there's been so much debate between club and county, um, obviously championships, being uh, packed in together. Do you think this is the time now for the GA to have a look at the club championship? Because before this really, it's been a joke. Yeah, I think, I think from my own point of view, it's been great to be involved with Limerick over the last probably 12 years. So like I haven't, as a 18 year old up to up to 30 year old now, I haven't really been part of that club scene at all, like bar the times where I'm returning from inter-county. Um, I know from I suppose my own brother, like um, certainly it's it's a diff- difficult um, one to manage that you might have a couple of games in April, um, maybe early May, and then you're not playing again till till kind of late August. So it's a tough one for a club player. So I suppose from not being there, it's very hard for me to to I suppose, give my honest opinion on it because it's probably not as valid as the as the club player who, who's experienced it. But um, I think there certainly needs to be something done. And uh, being back training, obviously last week it was non-contact and this week now it's contact. It's a tough one to get over. But what was it like going back training with the COVID-19 restrictions, no dressing rooms, sanitising before training? I'm sure it was a bit different. Yeah, it was definitely a bit different. Um, we, uh, I think I commented on it yesterday with a couple of lads. We were after training, um, just getting our, our runners on, sitting in the, in the stands all socially distanced. Um, it was kind of a, a bit of a novelty, um, but that's certainly not ideal when it's when it's flashing rain, like and you're trying to get off the field. Um, we we'll, we we'll be looking forward to getting back into the having the comfort of the restrooms, but um, I think you just make do when you get on with it. I think everyone's just so delighted to be back, and um, you don't really look look too much into it. And um, you're also the small corner board. How is it you tailor your game against a big physical opponent? Um, to like you've scored 23 goals and 132 points in the championship it's unbelievable really but how do you tailor your game to avoid big kind of hefty tackles and get on the scoreboard really um yeah it's a, it's a tough question i suppose over the years i've 
maybe try to bulk up a bit over, especially over the last maybe three or four years because of the way the game has gone. Um, but I suppose throughout my career, I would always be more focused on I was getting the touch very good so you can get away from players quicker, improving my footwork so that if a challenge is coming my way, I'm able to evade that challenge um, a lot easier than, than, than if I hadn't done that work. Um, and I suppose balls in the air, maybe touch them out to, to the ground, into space, maybe so I can get onto them um, that bit easier because obviously um, I know that balls in the air I wouldn't, wouldn't be my, my strongest point. So I suppose it's just focusing on my strengths um, and trying to really play to those strengths has been this is where my focus has been over the last 10 or so years. And was there a lot of pressure on you from a young age, say, you were on your club senior hurling team in Kilmallock at the age of 17, like, did, did you find a lot of pressure when you were playing at a young age? Uh, not particularly, no. This was it always been an aim of mine to, to play for my club, like, and I hadn't really looked past that because we had players like Andrew Shaughnessy in, in my club like that, that I really looked up to and this was coming out as a 17 year old um, playing corner forward for my club. Andrew was at full forward and as was, he took up most of the mantle in, in most of those games that I played in at that during that period and just to get to play and learn beside him was something that had really stood to me I think in my career. Um, so there, there was no real pressure at that time. We had a lot of uh, big players as well. And you were called into the Limerick senior team uh, in 2009. What was that like for you? Um, I, I, I suppose it was it was a, it was a great feeling. Obviously, um, for me and for my family, I suppose it was a very proud moment. Um, I probably took it a bit in my stride. Didn't really look into it too much. Um, I think these when these things happen, I suppose I kind of a mantra that you just take them in your stride and you just go with us. So. I wouldn't really be dwelling too much on the emotion of it, just just trying to get the best out of it that I can and, and, and enjoy it as much as I can. And obviously you, you're playing some serious hurling now at Limerick together as a panel and it's probably mainly be because all these Limerick lads coming up are used to winning things. But like, say for yourself, Nicky Quaid, Declan Hannon, like, you went through the hurt like the Limerick hurling teams went. Obviously, semi-final against Kilkenny, um, Porn Rain Day, um, TJ Ryan OB, you were very close that year. But to where you are now and to go through that hurt, the hurt you went through, it must be so pleasing. Yeah, I think it is. Like we've we had a fairly barren number of years, I suppose, at underage level, and in the first number of years um, in the, with the Limerick senior team. And I suppose with the new guys coming in that had experienced that bit of success, I think that this was mixed with with our. Um, our appetite for success and to join them and that success was a, a huge um I suppose when you couple those things together it was a big asset for the team. That experience and that appetite of the older lads uh, combined with that that success that, that, that those younger guys have been used to having. And um, what do you put that down? Obviously you didn't achieve an all Ireland through them years and um, probably weren't as competitive some years you would have liked to be. What do you put uh, not having success in those years, don't it? Um, I think there's a number of aspects to that. I think one of the first things is just a lot of those teams that we were getting beaten by, I think we might have lost maybe before we beat Cork in 2018, we might have lost four All Ireland semi finals. And it was a thing maybe that just those teams we came up against were more experienced um, and have might have be, been more confident and been more more used to winning our Ireland semi-finals and more used to being part of our Ireland final day and maybe we just had that element of doubt in our minds that that maybe we couldn't make that that final step or get to that final step and um, I think even in 2018 like like we were very close to, to that being one or more of those days where where we just didn't didn't push on it and and close out that game so um, I suppose it's that experience and and that used to winning those big games was the first thing. And then the second thing is just that bit of luck that that you have. Um, we just didn't seem to get that over the, over the number of years. Um, especially like you, you mentioned that game against Kenny in the rain. Like, and, like it was just a, it was a very close game and a, and a bounce of the ball either way. Like and we could have been in an all Ireland final. So um, I'd probably say that down to those two elements. Yeah. 
And to tell you when the monster child was massive, you, you weren't expected at all. And like when the Limerick supporters get behind you uh, and just winning the monster title, like that was massive for you, really, as players. Yeah, it's huge. Like, even I think it was on TV and there was a bit about it in the media over the last couple of months during the COVID. And I suppose as a player, when you're kind of stuck in the middle of it all these years, you don't ever really get the chance to reflect back on it and to see it see the crowd that ran the field that day and um, it's just amazing and um, the fans that they got behind us and were really hoping that that was going to be the year but um, the way it worked out obviously it wasn't and do you think really TJ Ryan doesn't get the credit he deserves for what he's done for Limerick Hurling? Um, I suppose in, in some circles he probably does and in other circles uh, maybe he doesn't but like from a player's point of view um, I think what he what he did with the team um, can't be underestimated. Like um, he had a, a fairly experienced bunch that that he won a monster with. But after that, after that, then or sorry, he, he came on in 2014 um, and took a team that was after win a monster, but integrated a lot of new guys into it that. So you said it likes the Keen Lynch, Tom Morrissey, Barry Nash. Um, so he was trying to mix the old with the new. And it's it's not a it's not a thing that's done overnight. Like, but if you look at the where those players have developed to now, like, um, I think TJ can certainly take a lot of credit for for what he did with those guys. And obviously, John came in and has been massive for you. Mm-hmm. But like your game plan now, it's really evolved. But like at the start, it took a lot of work. The short passing, your wing backs dropping back, like it like it's not as easy. I'd say as some people think it's been that. It's just transformed. Like it has taken you a while to get to where you are now. No, I definitely like them. I think a big thing is when new new managers come in. I think supporters and and stakeholders they all um, want immediate success, and then I suppose you need to give a manager time to get used to his players, and take a look at what he has, and equally for the players to get get used to the manager and the selectors and the and the coaches, and I suppose take on board what they want out of you. Because that oftentimes that players have to adapt and, and maybe change their game and that's not something that takes weeks or months like that takes a, a long period of time and um uh, I know so 2017 we obviously I suppose struggled to get a grip with that um but in 2018 then um I think from the way the season started um we just improved incrementally and, and built on, on on what we developed in 2017 and um, luckily enough it got us the, the whole way. And did you find it hard at the start to get used to that game plan? Um, I suppose we did. Like, yeah, I suppose we've been used to playing such a direct route of hurling for so many years. It was it was a big change for a lot of guys. Maybe the older guys, maybe more than so than the younger guys, because they played under John um, at twenty one level for a number of years. So I suppose it was integrating that direct that direct hurling that we've been used to playing with the our new our new style of hurling. So probably took a, took a bit of time. And then obviously in 2017 you didn't have the year you like, but in 2018 did you approach that year different to any other year you've approached as a Limerick early? Um, I wouldn't say I wouldn't say we did. Um, I think maybe from early on in the championship like we knew that we were in a good place, that we were I suppose, playing the way we wanted to be playing and, and getting some good results. Um, so I think once we started building some men- momentum, I think it just took on a life of its own from there. But I wouldn't say at the start of 18 we approached any differently to any other year. Um, I think it's just the way that the, the year panned out. 18, it was massive, obviously, beating Tip first round. He hadn't had huge success against him. But going down a man in Porky Quay that night and to get a draw, is that where you really started to believe that you could do something that year? Um, I think so. Like I think that night... Blown park weave. There was certainly a an air of something there that that we we could achieve something if we if we just kept up that that momentum. I think going down to fourteen men and putting in the performance we did, I think just really showed the character of, of the team. And I think it was something that the supporters, more so than the the feet of Tipperary, got behind the I suppose what we'd the passion we'd shown out shown that night and and to level it. I think it was quite Hayes level at the last minute and. It just gave us something again to build on because if we had, if we had lost that game maybe our season could have petered out like other seasons and obviously you didn't have to against kilkenny in recent years but 
beat them as well. Like that was a huge building block for you as a panel really to get over it to. Yeah, I think it, like it had been a number of years since we had hadn't beaten Kilkenny. Um, but I think that was maybe what caught the headlines after the game. Was I did I'm not sure was it thirty or forty five years or something that we hadn't beaten Kilkenny in, but it wasn't something that the team actually had really been focusing on or been aware of even. It, was, it wasn't something I'd been aware of before the game. So um, I think it shows uh, the mindset of where the team was at. Like, that's not something we, we had in our heads. It was just another game that we needed to, to win to, to get where we wanted to get. Um, and then moving on to the semi-final against Cork. What a game to be involved in. Probably one of the best ever games in Ireland. But like, you must have been so nervous as a player, Robbie O'Flynn coming through, and then Nicky Quay just to flick it like that. Like, it was such a fine margins in that game. You obviously took control an extra time, but your hand must have been on your heart at that stage, up and corner forward. Yeah, that last that last ten minutes was just a phenomenal ten minutes of of, of hurling for for both sides. Um, I think obviously from that from a car point of view, um, it's not it wasn't ideal, but I know from my point of view. I was gone off at that stage, so I was sitting in, in, in the stand and I suppose at times it's nearly easier to be on the pitch than, than to be in the stand because I can't remember watching that last 10 minutes. Um, it was just such a nerve-wracking wracking period, of, period of hurling. Absolutely. And then, like, moving on to the final against Galway, did you find it hard, say, to build up to that final? You were, ma- you were massive underdogs going in and such hype, like, for a big county like Limerick. Was it hard to avoid it all? Um, I suppose to the extent you, you're you're going to have some element of it in your workplace or with your family or with your friends, but I suppose lucky enough I'm I'm working and living down in Cork, so um, I had a lot of a lot of um, exposure to to Limerick fans. Um, that some of the players might have been if they're working in a public place in Limerick. A couple of lads of teachers are working in the bank, and, and they would have found it more difficult than than I did. Um, so maybe I was protected from that that hype more than others. And then obviously uh, you defeated Galway in the final, and it was a huge scalp. They're obviously going for two in a row, a big physical side. And but she just came out thundering out the blocks from from the first minute really that day. And like Kyle Hayes, like at such a young age to put in a performance like that in an all Ireland final as well. Yeah, I think like. Getting a start in any game is key, like but I suppose against the reigning All Ireland champions in an All Ireland final, I think it was it was it was important that we got a foothold in the game earlier on, and which gave us some I suppose element of confidence that we could push on and and, and compete. Um, whereas if, if maybe Galway had went ahead by a couple of points early on, it would have been hard with their experience of All Ireland final day to to peg that back. Exactly, and they like Shane Dowling coming on, like. He was literally the super sub of the year that day against Cork, the penalty, a goal against Galway as well. Like, was there a huge emphasis, like, like more so than other years placed on your bench? Um, definitely, like, it's something between games in, in training where we might have had the A's versus the, the B's or, or a mixed green and whites or, or whatever it went, maybe. Like, there were certainly 25 to 30 lads that could have all been starting on that team like and you mentioned Shane like and that's what you talk about underestimating somebody like I think Shane Shane's contribution to the 2018 or Lord and win like can't be underestimated like um I know I think we had 15 all-star nominations that year but like I think you talked to anyone in Limerick they would have had at 16 like because Shane was just absolutely phenomenal and if you watch back that Lord and semi-final it's, it's nothing short of amazing what he did off the bench and um, so like to have have those impact subs is, is very important for a team and, and, and it just showed how important it was for, for us in 2018. And what was it like returning to such a long time for Dean McCarthy and to return with it, I'd say the scenes or something else? Yeah, I suppose you always uh, dream about winning an all Ireland, but um, you couldn't have expected the, the reception and, and the welcome we got in Limerick um, the day after. Um, coming into Conley Station was just just crazy altogether, and and getting the bus to, down to the Gaelic grounds um, and to see the crowd the crowd in the Gaelic grounds and along the streets it was it was nothing short of spectacular. Like it was pretty cool, yeah. And uh, Paul trainer um, gets huge credit, but what's it like to have him as a coach and obviously him training you? Um, 
Yeah, Paul's a, he's a good guy. Like he's, I suppose he's very clear on what he wants. Um, if he's not getting it, um, you'll know about it. Um, but I suppose he just he just the organisation and his attention to detail and his I suppose his love for coaching is what really I suppose brings on the players and and inspires the players to to really um, apply themselves as best they can. And then, like say, moving on to 2019, you came flying out of the blocks last year, and obviously came up short in the All Ireland semi final against Kilkenny, um, but could have went to extra time. Do you think he picked too early that season? Um, I wouldn't think so. No, um, obviously we had a good monster final against Tipperary um, and got to the All Ireland semi final. I think it was just the first maybe 10-15 minutes of that game against Kilkenny. We just whatever reason just weren't at our best um just lacked that bit of I suppose focus that bit of um killer instinct really and, and missed a lot of easy opportunities and I suppose from there it was a it was an extremely difficult lead to pick back um obviously we almost did it at the end but I think we didn't have any plans to, towards the result um, whatever decisions were like at the end of the game we knew we weren't at our best that day and Kilkenny were were far superior to us. And then the 65, Daryl Donovan, Donovan strikes it. Um, it was a 65, but the referee obviously makes a mistake. It was it very tough like during the winter as players to deal with that, not getting to a final? Um, I suppose, yeah, and in the initial I suppose, couple of weeks were extremely tough because um, you put so much in all year. But once you get back to the club and, and get back into club championship, um, lucky enough, my club will be competing for maybe county semi-finals, county finals regularly each year, year in, year out. So to have something else to focus on and just, just to get back hard and again, I think you 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 move on quickly enough. Um, if you were to dwell on, on decisions like that and games and losses like that, I don't think you'd uh, progress much um, in your own in your own development. And like what has done to change Limerick Ireland? Um, a, a league title last year, a Munster title last year, the All Ireland obviously topped the league this year, uh, undefeated five wins out of five. Like, what's he done to change, I suppose, the culture and the winning mentality? Um, obviously, John brings a lot of a lot of um, managerial skills to the table. Like, he's a very good people's person, and and his relationship with all the players is 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 excellent. Like, he talks to all the players and and gets the best out of, out of his players. But I think if you ask John himself, like the, the work that's been put put in in the club scene and in the schools, I mean the academies over the over the last number of years has really been the the bedrock to to our success. Um, um the likes of the Irish Belarusians, um, my own club Kamalak went got the All Ireland club final. The Pierce obviously won a couple of All Ireland clubs, um, and like Patrick as well, I've been pushing on and doing I've been pushing on over the last couple of years. So I suppose that healthy club scene and, and school scene really has been has been a massive um, plus for us and it's really helped John and his management team to to be I suppose bringing on new players and bringing in new talent year in year out to compete for places. Exactly and you can fly in really this year in the league at, um, five wins out of five as I was saying but to lose Richie English it'd be a major blow for any other team but Aaron Costello has come in at cornerback and has really made the jersey his own. David Dempsey has been flying out as well. And then there's some players not even getting games. Like it's You must be kept on your toes all the time, really, with the strength and depth within this team. Like you can't, I'd say you can't even underperform the training. Yeah, that's it. Like, like Aaron, Aaron's a guy from my own club. Like He's been pushing hard. He's been one of the best club defenders in the, in, in the county over the last probably five or six years. And um, thoroughly deserves his place and his, his chance. Um, equally, David Dempsey has been one of the Pierce's most dangerous forwards over the last four or five years. And like for a team that's been winning club championships regularly and monster clubs and Ireland clubs, like he's he's a guy that's not um I suppose a stranger to to that, this level hurling. Um, for myself, like in the full forward line, um, there's huge competition in there with with you, Aaron Galan, you, Shane Flanagan. Peter Casey, you Pat Ryan, you Adrian Breen, like you've a couple of y- younger guys then coming through as well, like that that are really pushing hard. So 
you have seven or eight guys that you're competing for three spots with so I think you're always kept on your toes and you always have to be improving yourself and looking after your, your body in terms of recovery and, and, and things. And JP McManus is a man often associated with the Limerick Curlers. Um, how, how do you feel dealing really with JP McManus and what has he done for you as hurlers? Um, I suppose from dealing with him, like we like as players, we don't have have very much dealings with with, with the man. Um, he's very much in in the background. He obviously gives financial support to, to the to the county um, over the last number of years, and I suppose that's and his own brother is is involved as well with the academy. So I suppose from that point of view, their support is is I suppose, usually appreciated by us as players. And, and by the, the management and by the county and this was it allows us to compete at, at the level we want to complete compete at. Limerick obviously won uh, two hundred twenty ones in twenty fifteen and twenty seventeen. Um twenty fifteen you have twelve players there who were starting and I think it's something like nine from twenty seventeen. Mm-hmm. Do you think that's the major difference like that you're able to get that many players over from the under twenty one team because under twenty one the seniors a massive step up like and you can have in counties where it doesn't transform to senior success, but it has for you. Do you think that's been a huge difference? Definitely, I think, yeah. Like, especially that 2015 winning team. I suppose TJ initially integrated them into our panel. And then, I suppose in 2017, I think, when John came on board and he'd been the 21 manager, you're looking for, initial, you're looking for I suppose, success straight away. With, but obviously, it took until 2018 when we had another bunch of, of our Ireland winners integrated into the, into the panel. Um, so I think the success that they have achieved over the last five or six years has been massive for, for Limerick and for just bringing that confidence back. Just uh, moving on now to the club, um, Kilmallock. Um, 2014, obviously great to get to an All-Ireland final, 2012 county title as well. Do you feel you underperformed on Paddy's Day that day against Ballyhale, or do you feel you just made a serious weapon? Um, bit of both, I think. I think the first half, I think we might have went in six or seven points down, but we'd hit a lot of wides. Um, we had a goal disallowed that probably shouldn't have been disallowed. So there was a number of, of factors in that first half that I suppose when you're six or seven points down then to Ballyhead were a serious outfit. Um, you, you, we probably felt deflated going into half time and probably didn't get ourselves together properly. And, and then in the second half, we were just blitzed and the game was over within five or ten minutes. and. It all just became a bit of a blur after that. But um, I think if we'd maybe stayed competitive for that first half, we might have um, stayed with him in the second half and gave ourselves a better chance. But the way it transpired, I think the game was over maybe at halftime. Um, but obviously, they've proven just to, to be an absolute animal of a, of a club team over the last decade or so. And club championship doesn't really get the credit it deserves. Like, um, there's some fantastic matches all over the country when it's in, like Limerick, Ireland, so competitive, Kilkenny, Galway, Cork, so so many counties. Like, and were you a bit disappointed that there's going to be no provincial club or no Ireland club championship this year? Um, yes, yeah, obviously it's, it's it is disappointing, um, especially if you if you push on and win the county. But I suppose that's out of our control and. Was the, t- the target always is at the start of the year is to, to get to a county semi-final and then, then the county final and hopefully win a county and you're never really looking past that so I think that's just still going to be the focus of, of, of every club players um, that's going to be their focus for the for the year um, and who knows like maybe there might something might come back on the cars later in the year um, I'm not sure but yeah Exactly, and the draw has been made now for the Limerick Club Championship. A tough enough group for yourselves. Um, Napierce, obviously, Declan Bannon from Tipperary involved with them this year. The Hain have been making strides, so it's not going to be easy, and I suppose you can't really be looking out ahead out of that group where you probably will be caught. No, certainly not. I think like the first game against Napierce, you got towards the end of July is key, really. If you can get a win in that, then you're kind of set up to, to make a quarter final or a semi final. If you lose that, you're under pressure straight away to to, to go and beat a hand. Um, so we'll be looking for the, to, the, to that first game eagerly, you know, and, and getting ready for that. And do you think you can make a job this year with Kilmallock to get to a county semi-final? 
Um, I think so. Like we've been in the semi final. I think the last maybe eight seasons in a row. So we've, we've won a number of counties and, and maybe lost a number a number of county finals. So I think if we can again reach that stage. It'll put us. This was winning a winning one game of a final again, and and I suppose it all just comes down to that day. And and this was the big thing. But us is just keeping our 15 players, our main 15 players, and our maybe four or five guys that are that are going to come on keeping that full 20 fit uh, um, because I think over the last number of years we might have been missing down two or three players here and there and it's very hard to, to replace those guys um, at club level. And obviously um, you came up against uh, Nipirci and Patrick well two machines but like is it hard coming up against a weapon like Nipirci when literally nearly every one of their players has played county at some stage? Yeah, it is, it, it is tough, like, yeah, um, and obviously their use of success through was their affiliation with Arts but Reach as well, um, so they are definitely a, a team that's well used to winning, um, but I suppose from our own point of view, I don't think there's there's many off our team that haven't played into county either, maybe two or three only, so I think we're, we're well matched in, in, in that instance, that's, in that sense, as are maybe Patrick, the Patrick's Wells and the Dunes. Um, you 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 struggle to find maybe two or three that haven't played inter county at some level. And the way you're talking, obviously, it must it's a really competitive championship, really, to win it down there. And like, there's obviously nothing easy, but it's probably not a championship that people think is that competitive. But as we're saying, you have your dunes, your past results, and peers to like, there's nothing easy down there. No, it's it's a usually competitive um, championship. I think it is probably underestimated in that sense. I think. People probably see certainly over the last number of years, the pier sheet has just been the kingpin, and then just coming out year in year out. But like, if you ask any of them, like they, they, they wouldn't underestimate the the Patrick Swells or or the Kamalaks, like or or the Dunes or the Dares, um, that it's under day. Like if you underestimate one of those opponents, like they will overturn you. So. And now just moving on to spill a few beans on a couple of the Limerick senior hurlers. Um, who would you say is the best dressed on the panel? Um, best dressed, I have to say, Paddy O'Loughlin. My own club man, he's put, in, he's put in a lot of effort into that over the last few years, so if I didn't pick him, no, he wouldn't be too happy. Um, worst dressed? Worst dressed? Um, that's a tough one. Um... I'll go with Keen Lynch if he wears some funky stuff, so I would I wouldn't get away with, with wearing it anyway. He pulls it off so. Um best in training. Um uh, best in training, I'd say Rich English. I think his attitude is always spot on. He's he always gives one hundred percent so. Um worst in training. Um worst in training. Um I uh, no one comes to mind really. I'll have to pass now. Um, loves, loves himself. Um, these are really put me on the spot here. <laughs> I'll go with Jamie Flanagan. And uh, then, um, in charge of music on match days? Uh, Tom Cannon. Then just finally, um, you're obviously involved with your fundraiser for the Midford um, Hospital and it was, there were some great videos going around anyways, but um, was it, I suppose it, it gave you something to do as players. Did you enjoy doing it and uh, how did the fundraiser go in the end? Yeah, like it was good. It was something different anyway. Um, so we just we were struggling to come up with some concept that was that was different and just wasn't um, the typical one that, that that I suppose had been done over the over the first few weeks of the of the COVID lockdown. So it was just something fun and something for the public to get engaged with. And I suppose every, the players themselves enjoyed doing it. While it was stressful enough to to come up with some sort of a dance, and uh, I think the fellas enjoyed it and really. I suppose got into it as well. So um, I think it was a success in the end. I think we raised about thirty thousand for Milford, and um, so it was it was a well worthy cause, and, and it was just good for 
something for the team to get involved with. Obviously, great to see you. Really, thanks a million for your time, and I uh, wish you best of luck in the championship and with Limerick as well. Okay, great stuff. Thanks, Bob. Thanks a million, Graham. Yeah. Cheers. I'll, I'll send you that um, recording. Yeah, perfect. Thanks for that, now. Yeah. Bye. Bye. Bye.